And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to um, speak here. And it's a pleasure to see some of the names of the participants. I haven't seen their faces, but when they entered the rooms, I recognize some people I know. <laughs> so um, I have moved away a bit from the um, quadratic forms and linear algebraic groups in recent years. And um, I fall more on the under the beyond bits of this seminar, I'm afraid. So what I want to do today is I would like to give you a taste of what I've been doing in the last uh, six or seven years. And um, this is concerning non-associative algebras, which one can construct from skew polynomials. And then I would like to um, give you a bit of an idea of a uh, flavor, say, of the theory. So the structure of the talk is as follows. I will start to give you an introduction to skew polynomial rings and remind you a bit what non-associative algebras are and how to measure non-associativity in them. Then I will actually go and talk about the construction of the algebras I've been working with over the last um, years. And then I want to highlight just some of the uh, relevant results, which hopefully appeal to this audience here. And um, these are concerning uh, generalizations of cyclic and differential algebras, non-associative ones, and um, algebras whose right nucleus is a central simple algebra. And my sales pitch is the following. I think these um, algebras, which actually go back to a French mathematician, to Petit, so they were um, discovered in a very um, hidden, they were, they were defined by Petit in 1966, over 55 years ago, and they were a bit hidden in a preprint series and were never published. And I stumbled upon them by accident. I talk about that a bit more later. So let's start with skew polynomial rings. So for the purpose of this talk, I will always assume that D is a unital associative division ring, sigma ring endomorphism of D, and then we have a left sigma derivation, delta, that is an additive map that satisfies this equation you see there. And then you define the skew polynomial ring, which I will always call R in this talk, as a set of polynomials. So one takes polynomials with coefficients in D and the addition is defined as you know, the usual addition between polynomials term wise, but the multiplication is skewed now. And for defining the multiplication, we are employing sigma and delta. And you can see the rule um, if we have T times A for some A in D and T is indeterminate, we multiply that. If we want to flip the A on the other side, pull it on the left-hand side, we have to say this is sigma of A times T plus delta of A. So this is a skew polynomial ring. Now the easiest example of such a skew polynomial ring is the ring of left polynomials. So re remember the D is not necessarily commutative. So one has to be careful with the order of the AIs and the BIs of the coefficients. And so if we are taking delta to be zero and sigma is the identity, then the usual multiplication is a special case. And we just can multiply as you can see there, the sum of ai t to the i, sum of bi t to the i, as the sum of ai bj um, t to the i plus j. Now, we can also define a degree of a polynomial. There's nothing new here. And it behaves in the same way, so that the degree of two polynomials, f and g, is the same as the degree, if you multiply them, the same as the degree of f plus the degree of G. We also have the reducibility, of course, in this ring. 
And so a polynomial f is irreducible if it is not a unit and it cannot be written as a product of two non-trivial polynomials g and h, so that we cannot write it as f equals g of h and the degree of g and h is strictly less than f. So this is actually something where we can kind of become and the degree and the ir irreducibility is all something we know. So what is very crucial in um, the whole construction now is that this skew polynomial ring has a right division algorithm. So that means if we take some polynomials f and g, and f is non-zero, then we will always be able to find unique, and this is relevant to unique, polynomials r and q, where the degree of r is less than degree of f, such that we can write g as a multiple of f, q times f, plus the remainder r. So this is what we will have to use now when we define our petite algebras, as I call them. There's also a left division algorithm if the sigma is an automorphism, but we don't need that. So um, the associative, well, the, the algebras I want to talk about are non-associative. So let me remind you a bit of what a non-associative algebra is. So I will always denote F to be a field here. And then if I talk about an algebra over F, I mean an F vector space together with a bilinear map. And this bilinear map from A times A to A is the multiplication of A. So you will see this is the broadest possible definition of an algebra. I'm not assuming anything. So what I will assume now for the purpose of this talk is that all my algebras will be unital. Now unital means uh, what we all think it means, there is a unit element. So there exists some uh, E, which we normally call one or one A, um, such that um, this is well, playing the role of the unit so that E times X equals X times E equals X for all X in the algebra. And um, we are mostly concerned with division algebras or checking uh, when an algebra is a division algebra. So um, what does that mean in a non-associative setting? Well, it means that if, well, the algebra has to be non-zero and if left and right multiplication of inside this algebra are bijective for all non-zero elements of A, then A is called a division algebra. Now it becomes a bit more straightforward if the dimension of A is finite, because then it's well known that A is a division algebra if and, if, if and only if, a doesn't have any zero devices. So we are looking at very crazy algebras, which are highly non-associative. And if we want to look at how well or how badly behaved a non-associative algebra is, one of the tools we have at our disposal is the associator. And we use that to define the left, middle, and right nucleus. And these nuclei, um, they measure how well behaved a non associative algebra is, how associative it is. If we intersect them all together, we get the nucleus. So now there's also the center. We can also define a center of an algebra in this non-associative setting. It is actually the same definition as we would use for an associative algebra, just with the additional twist that we're not just assuming that they're all elements 
of the algebra in it, which commute with every other element, but also they have to lie in the nucleus. So they also associate with all other elements. So this is all I need. And I'm going to the construction. So I'll take a skew polynomial F in my ring of degree M. Now, what can happen? So let's look at the ideal RF, the left ideal, this F generates. So this is a left ideal. And sometimes it can also be, when F is right invariant, a two-sided ideal, so that it is a left and a right ideal. So if this is the case, so for certain special polynomials, we have that these polynomials generate a left and right ideal. And so I call that two-sided ideal. In that case, of course, we have R, which is a non-commutative ring. We have RF, a two-sided ideal. We can mod it out. We get a quotient ring, well known. Now, what happens if this ideal, this left ideal generated by F is not two-sided, ha, you will know. Of course, then we still have a left R module. We can still mod it out. We can still mod it out. So let's mod it out. So we get R mod RF and we get a left R module structure. Very well known. What is less known and what really threw me a lot when I saw it for the first time uh, is that actually we have a non-associative ring structure on this R mod RF. So here it comes. So this is the main result in Petit's preprint. So let's take the uh, remainder of right division by F and let mod RF denote the remainder of right division. And we use this now to define a multiplicative non-associative structure. So we are taking all the polynomials in our skew polynomial ring of degree strictly less than the degree of our F, which we have fixed at the beginning. So we're taking an F of degree M, we're taking the set of all the polynomials of degree strictly less than this M. And now we define a multiplication. We're taking the, we're taking two polynomials of degree strictly less than M, G and H, and we multiply them together in the polynomial ring, G times H. But then of course we get something which will not lie in this ring I call RM of all the polynomials that lie, that have strictly degrees strictly less than M. So I'm taking this product G times H and now I'm computing modulo right division with F. So that I'm taking the remainder of when I take G times A, so this is Q times F plus some remainder, and I'm taking this remainder R, and this will be the product, the way I define the product of G times H. It's gonna be this R. And this is well defined. And this makes the, uh, this set into a unital non-associative ring that we denote by SF. And this is actually then an algebra over a subfield, which I call F0 of D. And this F0 is defined as all the A and D, where A times A is A times H is H times A for all the H in this ring, in this uh, not ring, in the set RM. So we have defined a non-associative ring structure or algebra structure on this set R mod RF. Now, how does this tie in to our classical setup? So it's a generalization. The classical setup where we're having a two-sided ideal and mod it out for the special types of F where F is right invariant and we get a two-sided ideal, well, this is exactly the case where the SF is associative. 
So our SF is associative if and only if F generates a two-sided idea. If and only if F is right invariant. In that case, we get the classical quotient algebra, which we all know. So this construction can be seen as a generalization of this classical quotient algebra. And if we kind of continue to look at it this way, we get quite some nice results. So in the following, I exclude the trivia case that the degree of F is one, and I'm always assuming it's gonna be degree greater or equal to two. Now I want to sum up some of the main structural results it's quite a long paper, but just to give some highlights. Um, so the first one is that, well, this algebra actually reflects the properties of the polynomial quite well. The algebra, I call it also petite algebra, this SF has non-zero divisors if and only if F is irreducible. That's the first observation. If this F is irreducible, then actually the right multiplication with uh, any element in the algebra is bijective for all non-zero for all non-zero elements and so sf is a right division algebra if f is reducible if it's also finite dimensional so if this sf is a finite dimensional f naught algebra and the f is irreducible sf is actually a division algebra Now, if the F is not right invariant, so we have a non-associative algebra as F, and it's not the usual classical quotient algebra, we can also say that the left and the middle nucleus of this algebra will always be D. So they're kind of boring, but not as boring as you think, because we can use them because of this later, we can use these algebras for code constructions, because this is a rather big uh, left and middle nucleus. And the right nucleus, and this is the interesting part that encodes a lot of the structure of the F, because the right nucleus turns out to be the eigenspace, what is called the eigenspace, if you look at the literature of skew polynomials, the eigenspace of the skew polynomial F. So this is interesting. So the right nucleus will change depending on the F. And this is a classic result, just rephrased on the setting and was proved by Petit in the setting. If F is irreducible, then the right nucleus is an associative division algebra. This is well known, was always proved without these algebras, but appears in this context again. Okay. So let's look at an example. So I take the complex numbers complex conjugation. And I look at the twisted polynomial ring C, T, and sigma is my complex conjugation. And the F I look at is going to be T squared plus one. So if I'm looking at the construction as F for this particular example, I will get Hamilton's quaternion algebras. So this is the case where we have a right invariant polynomial. The algebra is associative. And inside the algebra, we know that T squared is going to be minus one because of the construction. So this is of, of course, the example of a non-commutative central simple algebra. What we have, what, what is very interesting is that um, if we're taking now f to be t squared plus i, there's a subtle shift. So this is a very classic construction. And to my knowledge, it is the first known construction of a non-associative division algebra. And this is a very classic construction because it goes back to Dixon. It appears in a paper by Dixon in 1935. So here we have a case that the polynomial F is not right invariant. So we're getting a left ideal, which is not a right ideal. 
we are modding that out and we're taking this construction by petite so we get this um, non-associative algebra and that is actually a very classic example of a non-associative algebra for dimensional which happens to be a division algebra because it's very easy to show that this polynomial t squared plus i is irreducible. So this type of algebra is called non-associative quaternion algebra because they are so similar in the construction and indeed also in their behavior to the classical quaternion algebras, but they're non-associative. So um, these algebras were um, mentioned the first time by Dixon. And then there's a very nice paper by Waterhouse from 1987, which actually analyzes them very nicely and also checks um, in a more bro broader framework over any field when these algebras are division, when not this type of algebras. And, and then um, Vincent Astier and myself, we wrote a little paper on uh, generalizing these algebras over base rings. So um, these algebras actually also um, make me find Petit's paper because, and that brings me to the next question, are these algebras actually useful for anything? These Petit algebras, these crazy non-associative structures, are they actually useful? And um, yeah, they are. So petite algebras actually are called Johnson semi-fields and over finite fields, they yield um, a huge class of finite dimensional division algebras. And uh, they are analyzed and very nicely described and classified in a paper by Lavrand and Shiki from 2013. And I was uh, made aware of this paper and then of Petit's paper because I actually was trying to get my impact factor higher. My, well, I mean, I work in the UK and one has to look at the ref in this country. And so one has to have some applications. So I was kind of desperate uh, 10 years ago and I was thinking I have to do something more applied. So I uh, saw that there were these um, space-time block codes and um, there's one which is still used today so um, these are codes which are used in digital data transmission. And if you, for instance, pick up your mobile phone, if you take a, make a phone call, well, you will use the, probably very highly used, the, um, likely use the Alamuti code. So the Alamuti code is used to, basically you have two by two matrices. So there are two antennas, they're digitally transmitting uh, several times the same, uh, information so that you have the data loss accounted for because there might be some enacted fields. You will not all arrive at your phone, which has one antenna. And then you have to kind of, of course, you want to make a phone call. You have to decode it. So this is not about encrypting, it's about coding. And you want to find codes which you have, which are very optimal, which are perfect in the sense that you don't need much energy to decode. You don't lose much and you can recover the data. And so this bring, brought me to um, space-time block codes because um, after working with these Alamuti codes, which some engineer had discovered, uh, some pure mathematicians came in and said, hey, wait a second, this is the, you have to call this the um, Hamilton code because what you're working with are two by two matrices and they're not new. These matrices are actually the regular right representation of the uh, Hamilton's quaternions matrix. So then there was a boom over like 10 years. So many people like uh, um, Frédéric Gauguet and Martin, uh, they came and from number theory and said, ha, huh, if that works for quaternions, can it work for cyclic algebras? Can it work for central simple algebras? Can these constructions of these codes, which are basically um, families of complex matrices, can this also work when we are looking at um, regular representations of cyclic algebras. And so there was this boom in uh, decode in space-time coding. And so I hopped on the bandwagon because I realized that 
um, the fact that the petite algebras have a very, very large nucleus. Actually, we can't talk about representations here because they're non-associative, but one can just one can still produce these algebras, these, these matrices from these uh, from the left multiplication of these algebras. And, and so um, that's how I found these petite algebras eventually. And I started, however, to build fast decodable space-time block codes in reinventing petite algebras because I didn't know them yet. And um, so um, I was able to also prove that these were then behind the iterated codes constructed by Markin Oge and the engineer Srinath and Rayan. So um, nobody knew that at the point. So then I came and I brought it and I, I like to work in that area for a bit, but I was overtaken by the engineers because every time, and I tell you this as a warning, as a pure mathematician, if you're trying to work with engineers, they want the better one. They always want the better code. They don't think it's interesting to understand the theory. So they gave me some questions. I solved the questions after a year. I come back with the questions and they go, nah, we're not interested anymore because they were already on the next bandwagon of another because now they had found some more interesting code. So it, it was a very, very fun time, but it was also challenging because I had to get used to a much faster way of working. So um, anyways, we do what we do in our respective systems. Um, I uh, then calmed down a bit and I realized that they also used um, in other code constructions, like in F sigma delta codes, and uh, for instance, Q cyclic codes. And there the theory calmed down a bit because um, these are people who are working there who are like us, they're pure, so they don't rush so much. And um, then I realized that this actually, this whole theory of this non-associated petite algebras ties in very nicely because they can be seen as generalizations of classical uh, central simple algebras and also of Azomaya algebras, and also the automorphism group often behaves very similar. So this is what I want to focus on today. Looking at the target audience I have here. Um, so I want to talk about two things. Uh, one is this section, algebras whose right nucleus is a central simple algebra. So there are two cases. I will look at them separately. Uh, one case is characteristic not P, and the other one is characteristic P. So I'll start with a field extension K over F, where F is algebraically closed in K. And I'm taking our my um, differential polynomial ring K T delta. So now here, sigma is the identity. And I'm choosing the, uh, the delta so that um, the constant field of delta is f. And then I'm rephrasing a classical result by Amitsur to uh, my setting. And that says that if I have a central simple algebra over f of degree m, and this algebra is split by k, then a is isomorphic to the right nucleus of some petite algebra for a suitable f of degree m. So this is not my result, this is Amitsur. I just rewrote it in the terms of this algebra. And what is p here? Um, we have just any, we can take characteristic zero or well, we just take p is a prime. So we can take a characteristic zero for this. Think of it for this talk, characteristic zero, it will work. Um, then if we want to tie it a bit more together, uh, we can say for every central simple algebra of degree m, there is a field extension k that splits it, where f is algebraic closed like before in k, there exists a derivation, which has field of constants f, and there exists a differential polynomial such that the SF we get from this differential polynomial is an infinite dimensional algebra. And this algebra has right nucleus A and left and middle nucleus K. So if you think about it in terms of Venn diagrams, one can start to see 
this um, classical theory of central simple algebras, of differential algebras, of generalized cyclic algebras, whatever, in one bubble. And then around that bubble comes a bigger one where there are certain special cases. I mean, this SF construction is super general, but even some special cases in this construction, they are making a bigger bubble now around the classical associative construction. So this is one way to go. For instance, we take F to be the reals, we take Hamilton's um, quaternion algebra, and we take the function field of the projective real conic, uh, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is zero. Then this, of course, splits my quaternion algebra. So now I'm taking, there are many, but I'm taking a derivation where the uh, constant field of the derivation is R. And now I know that there will be some degree two polynomial F so that I get an infinite dimensional unital algebra SF where the right nucleus of this algebra is the um, quaternion algebra. So this would be one easy example of this setup. Now, if we have characteristic P, again, there is a classical result by Amitsu. We can read in this context. So if we have a P algebra, A of degree M, and this is split by some purely inseparable extension of exponent one, again, we can choose a derivation on this purely inseparable extension, call it K, with constant field F. And now there is this result by Amitsur that says that if M is less or equal the degree of the field extension, K over F, then we know that A is isomorphic to the right nucleus of some suitably chosen petit algebra. And we know that the F we need to choose here again has degree M. And one can refine this a bit. And in case that A is a division algebra, conclude that the following cases can happen. If the M, the degree of the F, which we know that exists, this F from the previous result, happens to be exactly the degree of this field extension, then actually the A is going to be isomorphic to petit algebra. And that of course implies automatically that F will be two-sided and irreducible of degree M. If M is strictly less than this field extension, then we can show there exists an irreducible polynomial of degree M such that SF is a division algebra of degree M times P to the E. If P to the E is the degree of the field extension. And of course, since it's a petite algebra, we know the right nucleus. Um, well, we don't know, but we can prove the right nucleus is A. We know that the left and middle nucleus are going to be K. So you can see that the classical theory slots in into this uh, more general setting. One can refine it a bit. So if we also know the index of the P algebra, and that happens to be P to the N say, and we know that M is R squared times P to the N, and this is less than P to the D minus one. So you can see this is a bit more of a technical result. Then again, we can find a suitable purely inseparable extension and a polynomial F such that SF constructed using this polynomial and this suitable extension is an algebra with right nucleus A.
Okay, I have a question. So is yes. that is that poly, is that polynomial explicit or no, it's not explicit. In certain cases, I can do it explicit, but it has to be um low um low m's. So if it's degree m is two or three, I get some explicit examples. Otherwise, I only know it exists. But I didn't really look at the explicit cases for higher degree. It would be actually very good. Um, it, it would be very nice topic for a PhD student. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. No, thank you, very good question. Um, so to tie this in with the uh, topic of the seminar series. So um, for instance, we can say the following questions are equivalent. What's the smallest possible dimension of an algebra SF that contains a given central simple algebra of degree M as a right nucleus? And that would be the equivalent to saying, to asking, what's the smallest possible degree of a purely inseparable extension of exponent one? That's the splitting field of A and satisfies that the um, degree M, that, that, that M, the um, degree of the algebra is less than K over M, uh, the degree of the field extension. So it is all kind of uh, interconnected. So uh, the second uh, taste. I want to give you is about uh, how to generalize cyclic algebras and differential algebras. So I will only concentrate here on the classic cyclic algebras. But if you know, if you happen to know what a generalized cyclic algebra is, one can do exactly the same also for generalized cyclic algebras and generalized differential algebras. So I will focus um, on the classic cyclic algebra. So um, we take a cyclic Galois field extension of degree M, K over F. And um, let sigma be the automorphism that generates the Galois group. So if you want to define an associative cyclic algebra, here's what you would do you would take K T sigma, this Q polynomial ring, and you would mod out the two-sided ideal T to the M minus A, where A lies is a non-zero element and lies in F, right? So this would be one way to construct a cyclic algebra of dimension M squared. I now work with non-associative algebras. And if I take exactly the same approach, but I don't restrict the A in the polynomial Tm minus A to lie only in F, then I will get what is called a non-associative cyclic algebra. So this is the immediate generalization of what I did in the example before, when I said here is Hamilton's quaternion algebra, and here is um, an example of a non-associative quaternion algebra. So now I'm generalizing cyclic algebras. So I'm taking the approach that I take f is t to the m minus a, and I have a Galois field extension of degree m. The F here has degree M as well. T to the M minus A has degree M. And if I would choose A in F, non-zero, I would get a cyclic algebra of dimension M squared. However, I choose it in K. So it could be an, an associative cyclic algebra, but if it's in K and not in F, it will definitely be a non-associative algebra. It will be a petite algebra. It will be actually, in many cases, very easy to see. Well, it becomes very easy when it's really non-associative to see when this algebra is a division algebra, which is one of the reasons why these algebras are so appealing in space-time block code constructions, for space-time block code constructions, because one can very easily construct examples of division algebras. I come to that. Now, what I want to... Um, Highlight a bit is um, the automorphism structure as well. So let's call 
what is what is an inner automorphism? Now, of course, we have non-associative structures. We are not allowed to remove the parentheses just like that. So how could we define an inner automorphism? So an inner automorphism of uh, such a non-associative cyclic algebra, or in fact, of any non-associative algebra, unity algebra, um, is an automorphism where we can write, let's call it G here, the G as MLXM for some M that has a left inverse I call ML. So this would be the definition of an inner automorphism. And the set of inner automorphisms is a subgroup. So one can prove that it's relatively straightforward. Now we all know that if we have central simple algebras, cyclic algebras in particular, all their isomorphisms will be inner. So now, of course, it's an interesting question because these algebras, I claim, behave super similar to the associative counterparts. So what are their automorphism groups like? So if F contains a primitive nth root of unity, then one can show that the uh, automorphism group of such a non-associative cyclic algebra has a cyclic subgroup of order M of inner automorphisms that extend the identity on K. If F has no non-trivial M root of unity and A also is not contained in any proper subfield of K, all the automorphisms of A are inner and extend the identity of K. And so one can actually show that the automorphism group is the kernel of the norm map of K over F. It's also easy, as I said before, to show that if N is prime at least, um, in this case, there's an easy um, property, then A is a division algebra if and only if uh, the A which is used in this the A in the polynomial T to the M minus A we're using in the construction. If um, A is unequal to sigma to the M minus one of Z, sigma to the M minus two of Z, dot, 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 sigma Z times Z for all Z in K. And this is a very nice um, criterion one can actually check in special cases. So um, when, we, when we did these code constructions, we were able to come up with um, codes that were um, very well behaved because we need them to come from division algebras. And um, we were able to show that the codes behind, that the algebras behind some codes the engineers did were actually these non-associative cyclic algebras. So now if we have, on the other hand, a field of characteristic P, and we're looking at the case that delta is an algebraic derivation of K, which has the particular minimum polynomial T to the P minus T, so very special case. And F is our constant field of this delta. Then we're looking at the case that K over F is a purely inseparable extension of exponent one. And for this case, I will define a non-associative differential extension as the algebra that we get if we take as our differential polynomial ring k t delta and as the f which we are using in our construction we are choosing t to the p minus t minus d so this is a direct generalization of amitsu's definition of a differential extension okay here we are again are using d is in k which is the generalization, because he said D is an F. So now again, we're getting a very easy criterion on when this non-associative differential extension is a division algebra. Much easier than in the associative case, we can say that the algebra is the division algebra if and only if um, some formula, which I'm not giving you here, is unequal to D for all Z in K. So 
actually, I think, yeah, no, I give it here. Sorry. <laughs> here it is. So if this holds for all Z, we know the algebra is division. And its automorphism group, again, has a cyclic subgroup of order P that leaves K fixed. So these two theorems, generalized results by Amitsur, on non-commutative cyclic fields in this very famous paper from 1954 to the non-associative setting. And there are many more. But as I said, I only want to give you a taste. So let me give you a taste of the other things one can do. Um, first of all, one can actually define these algebras much more broadly because we do not have to assume that the D, which we are having in the R in our skew polynomial ring, is a division ring. We don't need that. We can take any, um, any ring. We don't have to have a division ring. What we need in the construction, the only thing we need is that F has an invertible leading coefficient. So that gives quite some scope. Then, as I said, I um, started out with these space time block codes, got scared by the engineers, ran away after three years um, because I couldn't keep up with their um, pace and found applications, however, to other codes. Um, so these are implicitly already there, these algebras. And actually, once one uses the uh, structure theory one has in place for non-associative algebras, and it's always nice when one has two areas which are overlapping, um, one gets also applications to um, yeah, F-sigma delta codes, which are, for instance, in coset coding. We can generalize the classical construction A for lattices from linear codes. We can look at lattices and this natural, there are natural lattices and this um, petite algebra one can use for that. Um, we can construct um, codes over finite rings like that. And um, we can also go back and construct the, um, the automorphism groups of certain Jarchons um, and semifields. Um, then we can uh, obtain uh, non-associative cyclic extensions of central simple algebras, which is what I hinted at a bit right now. And um, we can reprove certain classical results by Albert on associative solvable cross product algebras in this kind of more modern language. Although, of course, as I said, the results go back to 66. So there was old as I am. And we can also obtain families of loops uh, with non-trivial automorphism group and inner automorphisms, which were not known before. So um, this is all I wanted to talk about today. And I hope I gave you a bit of an idea of this, um, what I find very exciting area. And I had three PhD students on this now, and there's still scope for more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great, thank you. So questions, comments, you can you, please yes, be free okay. to use the chat. Oh okay, God, where's for... the chat? Wait, wait, I have to find the chat. Where's no, no, do not chat? worry. I do not worry. I, if there is something you moderate. I, I, I translate. Okay, okay. Uh, do exist operator sigma and delta at the quaternion algebra? And what is the expression? Again, sorry, I didn't hear you. Do exist operator sigma and delta in quaternion algebra? And what is the expression? I'm not sure I understand the question properly, but I mean, um, basically, if I understand, I answer what I think I understand. So if we take D to be a quaternion algebra in our ring, D is a quaternion algebra, then what, not, what we, um, then normally the delta is trivial and sigma, we can take any um, involution on the quaternion algebra. Uh, uh, any, uh, any asm, sorry, not involution, any automorphism, for instance, of this quaternion algebra. Any inner, any inner automorphism. Oh. Okay, then there is a small problem because uh, polynomial, uh, i x minus x i minus k in quaternion algebra has the set of roots which infinite it depends on two constants 
but not any quaternion is the root of this polynomial. How you can express, how you convert this polynomial to left sided and show- I didn't understand the, how, how can I, what the polynomial, what? Uh, okay, oh. I will copy this to the chat, one second. Okay, Ch type. <laughs> because I wouldn't, ah, okay. Two which have roots. This uh, second question, these two questions in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit too complicated for this. I could email you the answer. I mean, I have to think about this. I haven't done this in two years. I think um, basically one way one can, um, I'm not sure. I have I to mean, think about this. I'm a bit about out of it question. because, I... because for instance, the fundamental theorem of algebra, um, if, I, mean, I don't know, is... I don't know. I can't One answer second. that on the top of my head. I, I would need explain. paper and I would need five minutes. No, no, man, no problem. Okay, you have the question. Okay, you, we can. I need the problem with the first question when I try to uh, design a differential equation in quaternion algebra, which has two different roots. And I discovered this, that this polynomial only can be two-sided. If I try to make this polynomial one-sided, then it has only one root and uh, division by this uh, root will be a polynomial of first degree, which has no root at all. Uh, you, I, I can give you a remark to the, my paper in Arxiv. Uh, oh, that would be great. Yeah, because but, I wrote another, I wrote a very short thingy about how to prove, um, yeah, well, if I would only remember what I proved. Well, there was something similar. <laughs> if you email me, if you email me your paper, that would be very appreciated. I'm yeah, a bit out of it. I've yes, been through a pandemic. I haven't done anything in two years. <laughs> yes, I found your paper in Arxip, Ar Ar so I can mail you my questions. So it's oh, good. thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, so, I mean, yes, the goal of this question, uh, question session is not to answer all possible questions at least to, to ask questions. So uh, are there other questions or comments? So I was wondering if the division algorithm in these polynomial rings that you showed at the beginning, if that leads to a unique factorization of some kind. Well, I think it does in a sense. I think there are several papers by some Spanish and uh, colleagues. And if I wouldn't have COVID brain, I would actually remember the names. <laughs> um, yes, it does. So um, they're basically these um, skew polynomial rings are actually up to isomorphism, the only ones who have some kind of generalized um, Euclidean algorithm of this type. I was hoping there would be others because then one could perhaps generalize this whole construction. And um, yes, I think the answer is yes. Yes. Okay, so maybe somebody, some, so somebody uh, want to, to, <laughs> to say something about that? I mean, no? Okay, so other questions? <clears throat> Who is next? No? Well, I have a question, namely, um, do these uh, non-associative algebras do we know some polynomial identities? Like there are special classes of non-associative algebras which could occur, like alternative algebras, for example. Well, not to speak I of have, yes, I, I, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There are some identities, but I haven't looked at that part particularly. It would be an interesting question. Um, what I have focused on so far is on their automorphisms, basically, and on these classical results that I try to generalize. And I also focused uh, on their um, well, on the on the matrices which we get if one looks at the um, left multiplication, for instance, inside this algebra, because these were used in the code constructions. So um, these were the questions I looked at. Okay, thank you. Okay, so okay, so if there are no no other questions, no no. Well, okay, you so, mentioned automorphism ah, groups. What kind of groups come up 
uh, as automorphism groups of these algebras. So far, very boring ones. So the structure is not that interesting. Um, I'm able to write down um, explicitly the automorphisms of several of these, like of the non-associative um, cyclic ones. But um, I, I have not been able to really, I don't think they are that uh, structurally that interesting. I don't think. But I'm not such a, such, I'm not that good in this group theory thing. So it would be interesting to really understand the structure, but I, I'm afraid it's probably not that interesting, but I'm not the best to ask. I'm not the best person to ask this. So any um, chance that maybe you get E8 this way? Would be lovely. I don't know. I can't answer that. I was hoping to get, I just got the funding for another PhD student. Now the, the guy doesn't want to come. So I don't know. <laughs> I want to start doing research again. I had to stop two years ago. So thank you for all the nice questions. You're giving me hope that I have some ideas and I can start again eventually this year. Yes, yes. E8 is quite challenging, I should say, but why not? Okay, so uh, so 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 we stop for today. Thanks again, uh, Suzanne. Okay, so people Thanks clap on this stuff. So next week, uh, same time, uh, Fabio uh, 